Um, hello, my, my name's um, William Thorne. Um, I'm here to um, open uh, this seminar. Um, my role is basically managing the PIAC um, project uh, within um, the OECD, and it's um, my pleasure really to introduce, um, to welcome you all uh, to this seminar on the use of test scores in secondary um, <coughs> analysis. Um, this is the third um, of the international or the PIAC international methodological con um, uh, seminars that we've held um, over the last few years. Uh, the first was on uh, quality in large-scale assessments. Uh, the second was on issues of um, translation. Um, and this third one is on, as the title says, the use of, of use of test scores in secondary analysis. I mean, part of the objective of these series of seminars is to first have a, 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 a wide discussion of um, important issues um, that relate to um, large-scale assessments and, in particular, to, to PIAC, um, the Program for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies. But another aim is to try and bring together the different communities that are involved in these um, kind of studies. Um, particularly on the one hand, um, survey specialists and psychometricians, um, <coughs> translators and uh, those who use the translations, and in this case, um, the users um, and producers of the data from these kind of assessments. Um, obviously, I mean, the background to, to this particular seminar is the increased availability of data from these large-scale standardised assessments. I mean, we've certainly got a range of studies relating to, to students, such as PISA, um, the US studies, uh, TIMS, uh, PEARLS, and in terms of um, adults, uh, in terms of measures of literacy and numeracy, we've got the IALs, all and PIAC um, um, series. I mean, obviously, this is of interest both to educators but also more widely to um, economists and sociologists, um, particularly um, because of an interest in uh, information about cognitive ability um, as a better measure, potentially, of, uh, of human capital. And certainly we've seen with, with PIAC, the data from the adult assessments, uh, a wide usage of the data um, in a range of disciplines such as economics, education and sociology. Um, certainly in terms of this particular um, seminar, um, we're trying to make the, uh, discuss the, the issues of um, basically the, the usage is in terms of primary and uh, secondary <coughs> analysis. Um, I mean, as users of these data are all aware, the, these large-scale assessments are basically designed to give you good estimates um, of the proficiency of the population. Uh, they're not intended to give you um, <coughs> estimates of uh, proficiency, for example, for example, in literacy and numeracy um, at the level um, of individuals, and the, the, the design is really um, <coughs> made to optimise measures at the, at the level of the population. And certainly there we have, um, on the one hand, we have descriptive uses of these, these data, um, giving us an idea of the, the, the level and distribution of proficiency um, in the population. And then obviously there's the, the interest in the secondary analysis of, of these data, going more deeply into trying to uh, look at the relationships between background variables and, uh, and performance, and um, particularly skill formation, um, <coughs> and uh, skill returns to skills, for example, at the individual level, um, as well as trying to answer, such as one can with a cross-sectional study, um, causal, um, making causal inferences. Um, as probably all of you are aware, um, in this conference, the, the use of these test scores in secondary or individual level analysis is not always very straightforward. Um, it's in, in particularly important for people to understand um, how the test scores were estimated and I know most people have some trouble with the, with the notion of plausible values and um, the apparent circularity of the, of the creation of these uh, values at times and I know this kind of issue will come up um, today in this, um, uh, in this seminar. Um, and, you know, there is a tendency um, among an analyst to, to, off, to often use these test scores um, rather naively. 
And certainly here, I mean, we've, we've certainly found that, you know, there tends to be a bit of a, a disjunction sometimes between, um, <clears throat> on the one hand, the group of people who are involved in the production of these um, assessments, survey methodologists, uh, psychometricians, uh, assessment <coughs> designers, um, <coughs> and the, the users of these test scores, the analysts, uh, um, <coughs> people who are, you know, doing the... <coughs> trying to make sense um, of, these, uh, <coughs> of these particular studies. Um, and really, um, one of the main objectives here, as I've said, is to bring those two communities together so we can have a dialogue and people can perhaps better understand uh, the issues that uh, <coughs> everyone's facing and, uh, well, help, help people go forward in terms of the analysis um, of these data. In terms of the agenda, um, what we have is a... Uh, firstly, we'll have an overview session, and I think people have started to come up to the table here. Uh, we've got Jesse Rothstein on <coughs> why the use of test scores in secondary analysis <coughs> can be problematic from an economist's perspective. Uh, Matthias von Davier on how and why test scores are estimated the way they are. And Matthias, I think many of you will know, has had a very long um, <coughs> experience with um, a number of these studies, such as uh, PISA, um, the US um, studies as well as um, PIAC and the uh, <coughs> studies of adult proficiency that has been un undertaken under the aegis of the o OECD. Um, these presentations will be discussed by Andrew Ho and Edwin Leuven. Um, then we move on um, to have two discussions <coughs> to discuss specific issues and applications. I won't run through the agenda to take up more of your time, but you can see them on the uh, screen. Uh, we'll also have a session on available software and a round table um, to have an open discussion which will be moderated by Michaela Pellizzari. Just to note that we've reordered sessions four and five and the software session will go before um, the round table. So um, I don't want to make, take up any more of your time. Uh, I'd like to invite the first speakers up here today and uh, I hope that this... Um, <coughs> turns out to be a, a, a useful uh, and fruitful um, seminar. Uh, one of the objectives is obviously to stimulate discussion and I would uh, encourage you all to um, ask uh, as many questions as you can think of to our presenters um, and discussants because, I mean, this is a real opportunity for many of you to um, have a range of experts uh, here and um, uh, raise, you know, a, a number of these issues that are, are very important um, in terms of the analysis of these large-scale assessments. So uh, thank you very much for coming, and uh, we turn now to the first session. Thank you, William, for the introduction. Uh, well, thanks, of course, to, to, to all the speakers who have agreed to, to participate. I think we have a, a really impressive lineup of, uh, of people uh, today. Uh, and so it's my great pleasure to, to introduce uh, Jesse Rothstein, who is Professor of uh, Public Policy and Economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Jesse, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I think my slides should be coming. There we are. Great. Um, okay, so this is, this is a really exciting opportunity. Um, this is a, I'm going to be presenting based on a paper I wrote a couple of years ago with Brian Jacob, who, like me, is trained as an economist, but as somebody who works a lot with, with testing data. And we wrote the, this paper because we had been running the kinds of regressions that our colleagues ran, run, doing the kinds of analyses we did, and, th and then we kind of started digging into the materials and trying to understand what the data came from. And the more we learned about it, the more uncomfortable we were with, with the way that we used it. That there, didn't, there seemed to be a real disjunction between the way that, that everybody used the data and then if you learned about how the data was created, how it was created and what sorts of uses it could support. And uh, we saw, we saw our, our job as a kind of translation exercise to help economists understand these things that were all buried on page 785 of the, of the technical manual um, and try to Inform, inform people and, and maybe that would lead people to rethink the kinds of analyses they're doing. Um, and so that's going to be the spirit of, of my talk today is to try to try to exp translate into my language the things that, that, um, that I think I, I need to know in order to use these data. Uh, and some of this is going to be really synthetic trying to pull together things that are showing up in other papers that are also on the program so I will spend less time 
trying to give other people's talks for them and try to tell you where, how that fits in. Okay, let me, so let me just start out. So is it, this conference is great. There have not been very many times in my professional life where I have interacted much with psychometricians. And I've probably done more of it than just about anybody else I know who does the kind of work that I do. And that, to me, is a problem. I think there, the, that there's lots that we could learn from talking to each other. And again, the, my goal here is to try, to try to kind of build a little bit of a framework for that discussion. Some of the costs that I see coming from the lack of interaction is that there's really, a, a, as I said, a disjunction between the way the data are created and the way they're used. The way, the, the way it's used doesn't align with the way it's created. And the way it's created might not be the best way to create it, given the way it's, it, I think, is at least intended to be used, or at least some of the intended uses. So that's, what, um, that's basically the, the broad story. I want to focus on the kinds of analyses I do, and I'm going to use a really simplified, stylized view of the kinds of analyses I do. The kind of analysis I want to do is I want to run regressions. And I'm going to focus on simple OLS regressions. I'm not going to worry about endogeneity, no instrumental variables, no research design, none of that. Take for granted that for some reason I have a, I have a, set, a simple cross-sectional regression that I'd like to run in the population. One regression I might want to run is of, of the student's achievement or proficiency on some characteristics of the student X. I'm going to call that de the dependent variable case. Okay, And X could be individual characteristics. Probably more commonly in my life, it's, it's policy variables. So to, to make it concrete, I did a study a, a couple of years ago where we ran regressions of test scores on school funding rules in the state. And with the idea that the funding rules might have changed over time and we had a strategy for claiming that we could get the causal effect of the funding rules on, on the, the left-hand side variable. And so the left-hand side variable we wanted was test scores. And so ideally, we would have the student's true achievement. Unfortunately, no matter what I would like, would like the psychometricians to be able to pull off, we're never going to have a we're never going to have true achievement in our data set. We're going to have some estimate of achievement. So I'm going to call the true achievement theta and the, the estimate theta hat. And we'll talk about the properties of that estimate. Then the other kinds of regression we might want to run are uh, models that have achievement on the right-hand side of a regression. So we're going to regress some other variable on achievement with some controls. Um, and I'm going to call that the independent variable case. And I would say like the classic example of this is work that's tried to explain the black-white earnings gap has often, has often put into those regressions a measure of, of achievement at the end of school with the idea that if to the extent the earnings gap is due to, to discrimination, we should still see a gap once we control for, for achievement. But the, if, achievement, if including achievement in the, in the regression reduces the black-white gap, that would suggest it's, it's more due to what are, what the, what's sometimes called pre-market factors due to human capital than it is to, to um, discrimination. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time defending the, the, the interpretations of those kinds of regressions. But let's just take for granted that we'd like to run a regression with the student's true achievement on the right-hand side. OK. So those are the kinds of regressions we'd like to do. Again, I'm going to set aside all kinds of questions about causality. I'm also going to set aside questions about not having enough data. I'm going to assume infinitely large cross-sectional sample, representative cross-sectional samples, and just think about what, what are the consequences in a large sample of using theta hat instead of theta and try to think, talk through what properties we would need theta hat to have in order for these regressions to give us the same answer as they would if we actually had theta. And then whether that, those properties that we needed to have align with the properties that it actually has. OK. Um, and again, to further narrow the scope, I'm going to focus on what, what um, Henry Brown and, and Matthias call large-scale assessment surveys, LSAS, the kinds of, of data sets that the OECD creates, the NAEP, which is the one that I'm most familiar with, which is not a, obviously an OECD data set. Um, but the idea of these, of these data sets is that they're designed to, to they're really large scale, repre somewhat representative samples that are really about telling us about the broad distribution of achievement in the population. The primary goal of these is not to provide individual level data. They're, they're, the primary goal is to provide distributions for the population or for particular well-defined subgroups of the population. Um, sometimes that could be a state or a country. Sometimes it could be a particular demographic group. But the idea is before we ever wrote the test, we could have told you which groups we needed to, to have estimates for. And, and, we, and it's a relatively small number of groups. These tests are typically fairly short because they're separate from the regular educational process and they're used for research. They, 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 we don't want to take too long. And so we have a limited number of items for each student. 
Uh, they'll often have multiple test forms to try to reduce spillovers and other kinds of problems that would arise if everybody was answering the same questions. Um, and then while we're going to generate individual proficiency estimates from these tests, those are really not the main point. Again, the main point is population level distributions, not individual proficiency. But we do generate individual proficiency. And arguably, one of the points of these tests is to allow analyses that were not anticipated at the time the test was designed. Analyses like the dependent variable and the independent variable case. Not the main goal, but, but we presumably release these, these um, microdata samples for a reason, and, and we want to be able to use them to, to support that kind of analysis. So I'm going to focus on two issues. Again, I'm not the only one talking about these today, so I'm going to try to preview others. One is that the scaling of these tests is arbitrary, and that's not in any way a criticism of the test makers. The scaling of any test is arbitrary. This is a fundamentally unidentified problem, and so we have to make decisions there, and, and we ought to be aware of that. And then the second is that the individual proficiency measures there is a process that creates them, but it's not a process that's, that fits with the mental categories that somebody like me grew up with. In particular, I'm trained to think about, okay, we have real data, and then we have data measured with classical measurement error, which is the truth plus random noise. And then the test scores we get out of these systems don't, don't align up with those categories. And so that means that, that we need to, think about, need to change the way we think about how they're going to fit into the analyses. Okay, so let's talk about scaling first. So the fundamental problem here is that achievement is, is defined ordinally. We can, uh, we, we, can, we can say without any sort of extra assumptions, we can say that Brian's achievement is higher than Jesse's achievement. That can be, that's a totally indefensible neutral statement, or totally defensible neutral statement, okay? <laughs> what we can't say is anything at all about the magnitude of the difference between Brian and Jesse. The fact that theta Brian is higher than theta Jesse is defensible. The fact that the, the, any, any statement about whether that difference is big or small is a function of the scale, and that scale is entirely arbitrary. There's nothing in the test that can tell, a better test can't tell us about whether that's bigger or smaller. It has to be information we bring to the design of the test to decide whether the difference between skill A and skill B is large or small relative to the difference between skill B and skill C. So that is to say that if any statement we want to make about theta that, wouldn't be, that isn't true about theta squared or the square root of theta or the log of theta or the uh, exponential of theta or just the single step function, which is an indicator for whether theta is bigger than some level. Any statement has to be true about all of those. And if it's not true about all of those, then it's a statement at least in part about the scale, to, scale that we chose to assign to the test, not about the, not about the underlying achievement distribution. Okay, and that's obviously a problem for linear regression. If we're going to run a regression, we actually need the scale to mean something. And if it doesn't mean anything, then, then again, our regression is telling us some, as, as much about the scale as it is about the, the underlying data that we're trying to model. Um, apparently I have to face this way, oh, or I have to push the right button. Um, okay, so what options? I'm going to say a couple options that don't work. The first option that economists always use is, okay, well, I don't know what the scale is. I don't know what a 300 means or a 400 or a 1,075 or something. So I'm just going to convert it to a z-score. I'm going to subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, and that solves my scaling problem. And the answer is no, of course, that doesn't solve your scaling problem. It, it, allow, it, make, make it makes it easier to interpret a coefficient in the regression, but we're still at the, at the mercy of whatever scaling, scale that the test makers decided to put on these sco scale scores. It doesn't, it doesn't change that. All, all this solves is the labeling problem, basically, about, about what numbers we decided to use. Um, a second option that I think is often attractive is, well, look, we had this great team of psychometricians who designed this test. They put a lot of effort into the development of the IRT model. That solves our problem because that gives us a scale. And no, that doesn't solve the problem either. The, the IRT model, there is a scale, but there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing in the world that tells us that that's the right scale. That's, that's entirely just about mathematical convenience. Okay. So I think the better options um, are, uh, and I'm going to defer to Tim Bond, who's going to talk a lot about this today. First is you want to check the robustness to transformations. Again, if, if statements we want to make need to be true about theta squared is just like they are about theta, we should check that the analyses we're going to do are, are robust to squaring theta or taking the square root or to other, other transformations. Now, I might not go as far as Tim would in saying that we should try all possible transformations because to, but we all, in every situation I've seen, what we wind up with is not being able to say anything at all if we do that. 
but there's, there's probably work to be done on what are a reasonable set of transformations that we might want to consider and, and say that we're going to draw conclusions that are conditional on, not, on us having made good judgments about what's reasonable. Another approach is, is to try to scale to some other metric that we do think has an interval property. So sometimes it's scaled to wages or to something else that, that we might want to use. And I think those are reasonable, reasonable approaches. Okay, so, but since Tim is going to talk about that, I'm going to move on from this and talk about the other, other stuff. Um, but let me quickly just explain why I think IRT doesn't solve the scaling problem. Um, and again, I'm going to just put this up. I know some people in here are much more familiar with IRT than I am. But in case there are people who are not as familiar as I am, I thought I should talk very briefly through what IRT is. The idea here is it's basically a parametric model for relating theta to the probability of an item being correct. And a common IRT model is what's called the three-parameter logistic, where the probability that, that, that a person with, with uh, ability theta gets an item correct depends on the, on the exponential of uh, parameter A times theta minus another parameter B, multiply, uh, adjusted out front with, a, with another parameter C where those parameters are meant to capture that some items are harder than others, some items are better at discriminating between high theta and low, and low theta people, and then some items are more guessable than others. Even if, even by somebody who had an infinitely negative theta, they still might get it right. And so, that, so we fit a model like this, and, when we, and we get a bunch of items for each person, and we fit this model, and that, and that gives us an estimate of the theta. And, our, and there's only one set of thetas that would, that would, gener that would fit the data best. And so that, in some sense, gives us a scale for, for distributing people. Once we've specified this model, we know what a one-point one increase in theta does to the probability of getting each item correct. The problem with this is that the, the observed responses are equally compatible with any other scale that's a monotonic transformation of that theta. If we wanted to use theta tilde, that's g of theta, for any monotonic transformation g, the data would fit just as well. We would just plug into our, our likelihood g inverse of theta tilde rather than, than just theta. There's nothing in the data that can tell us which of, the, which of these is the right model. OK, so that's a, that doesn't solve the problem. Now let's move on to proficiency estimation. Um, so again, again the, the fundamental issue here is that the tests are short. We don't have time to give everybody thousands of questions. We have a small number of questions. And if we wanted to, to identify any individual's proficiency, theta i, we would need a long test. With a short test, we have a noise, at best a noisy measure of it. So again, there are three goals that we want to support. One is this characterization of the distribution of theta in, in what predefined groups. And then the other are the two cases I talked about earlier, using theta as a dependent variable and using it as an independent variable. One other thing I wanted to add here is that case, goal two nests a version of goal one. If there are groups that we want to get the distribution of proficiency of, that we didn't know ahead of time. Maybe we designed the test to give us state level proficiency, but now all of a sudden we want state by race level proficiency. That's gonna, be, that's gonna take the form of runner regression of test scores on, on indicators for each of the groups. And so that's a version of, of goal two, even, even though it's, it also aligns with goal one, goal one, because we didn't know it ahead of time. Okay, um, the, as was mentioned, many of these studies use what are called plausible values. Which are, which are draws from the posterior distribution of individual, response, individual proficiency theta given the item responses and given a vector of student background characteristics z. Okay? Um, what I'm gonna basically argue is that you can use PVs if, we, if you're only after goal one, but really if you're only after goal one, PVs are kind of overkill. They're, they're, they're more than you need if goal one is your only goal. And if you're after goals two and three, PVs are not automatically the right thing to be doing. It, it's gonna depend on a lot of things that the end user doesn't necessarily know about the specifics of the model, whether, whether you can use the PVs that were generated with the test to, to pursue goals two and goal three. If we wanted to accommodate goals two and goal three for all of the regression models that secondary users might wanna run, we really can't use PV-like things at all. The only, real, the only real option here is to allow end users to model the item responses directly, to give them access to the item level data. Okay, so let me go through that quickly. I know I'm a little, little low on time. Um, a plausible value, let me just go quickly through the math, and if your eyes glaze over, that's okay. We'll come back to the, we'll come back out of this in a minute. We're going to assume, sorry, we're gonna assume that the individual proficiency theta i has some normal distribution where both the mean and the variance may depend on characteristic z, okay? An IRT model gives us the likelihood of the observed responses, 
call those capital R, given a theta. So the, we've specified a model that, gi that gives us a likelihood function if we knew the thetas. Uh, if we had infinitely long tests, we could just maximize that likelihood and we would get individual estimates theta i, but because the tests are short, we can't, we can't do that. So instead, what we, can, what we rely on is a Bayes rule transformation, which is we can specify the probability of theta given the item responses and your characteristics in terms of the IRT model and the underlying population distribution of theta, which is this, um, which is this normal distribution around, around mu z and sigma squared z. And we can solve, we can maximize this likelihood, we can, we can solve for these, the parameters of these functions, and then this gives us a probability distribution for theta, given your item responses and your, your characteristics. Um, so the, the basic approach that the test makers use is first they use all the data from all the students to estimate these relationships mu z and sigma squared z. And then once they do that, then they take draws from the posterior distributions. First from the, from the estimated distributions of, of mu hat and sigma squared hat because there's some uncertainty about, about those true relationships. And then also from the distribution of theta uh, given item responses in Z, given the, the, the draws on mu and sigma squared. Okay, um, for economists, they're the, probably the best analogy that people come across a lot is, is empirical Bayes estimation. In, uh, there are very, a number of settings where economists are relying on empirical Bayes to get posterior means, basically, of, of individual level unobserved parameters given some noisy estimate. Uh, empirical Bayes just gives you a posterior mean. Plausible values are draws from the posterior distribution. So it's not exactly the same, but, but that's the closest analogy. A closer analogy for people who are familiar with it is that this is really a version of multiple imputation, where we're imputing the unknown theta given the, the observed item responses R and, and characteristics Z. Okay, um, so suppose we want, suppose, let's now think about the three uses that I, I laid out. The first use is, suppose all we're interested in is knowing the distribution of scores uh, conditional on some, some vector of characteristics G. So this is our predefined groups situation. Um, and let's, I'm, for each case I'm gonna talk about what would happen if we just had a noisy but unbiased estimate of theta, the kind of thing I'm used to working with, and then what happens with, with, uh, um, with the plausible values. If we just had a noisy but un unbiased estimate, then that would, we could use that just fine to get the mean distribution across groups, but that would overstate the variance of the distribution within each group, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't get us everything we want. Now, if we have the plausible values, that gets rid of the bias in the, in the variance estimation. With the plausible values, we get accurate estimates of both uh, mean. I'm thinking of G as indicators for group membership, for some, for, for the predefined groups that we're interested in estimating. It could be, we could, it could mean something else, but I think that's the, the what I have in mind. Okay, um, so plausible values, we get, we, if you use the plausible values, the average plausible value conditional on G is an unbiased estimate of E of theta given G, and the distribution of them conditional on G is an unbiased estimate of the variance of theta given G. So it solves that problem, but it adds an extra step that we don't really need. If you think about the process of estimating the, the plausible values, the first step was estimating the relationship between mu and sigma squared and, and the, the variables, the background variable z. As long as g is a subset of z, that's all you really need, right? The, the distribution of theta given g is just an integral over the distribution of theta given z um, among the dis z distribution given g. Arguably, there's an efficiency gain of, of doing it this way of rather than using G from the very beginning of using all these background characteristics Z, it, I think it's analogous to the, to the post-stratification benefit that surveyors use where you reweight the data to match the known, known Z distribution that you should have. Uh, you, get some, you get some benefit from doing that. But once we've gotten this, this, these mu and sigma squareds, we don't get anything else out of this extra step of generating plausible values and then taking the distribution of them. All of the information is in the mu and sigma squareds. So the PVs are, maybe not, they're not harmful, but they're not really helping here. But this is the goal that they're intended for. Um, okay, I guess one other thing is we might not want to rely on this normal, normal approximation that the that, that true achievement is normally distributed around some z-specific mean and variance. But if we really want to be non-parametric, we're relying on a parametric model anyway. So we're, we're not really getting away from that. Okay, now let's get to the uses I'm more interested in using theta as a dependent variable. 
if we had a noisy but unbiased estimate, we'd be just fine. Again, this is the sort of situation economists are used to where we have a noisy measure of, of somebody's wages, but as long as it's a, mean, a classical measurement error, it's fine to use it on the left-hand side. Um, we don't have that. PVs can work in certain circumstances. One, one way to think about what PVs are is there's really two components of a PV. There's the posterior mean, and then there's some random draw from the distribution around that posterior mean. If we had the posterior mean, and if, um, well, you can imagine running a regression of the posterior mean on our, our x variables. That's great. The noisy part of the, the, the draw from the distribution around the posterior mean, that's drawn on the test maker's computer. That tells us nothing about the world. It just, we knew what there, there was some distribution, it's a random draw from that distribution. So having that extra draw from the distribution around the posterior mean doesn't do anything to help our, our regression. The bias we're going to get in our regression is the same if we're using the plausible value as, we're, as if we're using the posterior mean. And we'll be unbiased if the characteristics in our regression were all included in the model that was used to generate the, poster, the plausible values. Otherwise, we won't be. Okay? And again, that's fine if we're interested in regressions on individual characteristics because those are the sorts of things that are usually in the plausible value mo model. If we're interested in policy variables, it's much less likely that the, the test maker is going to have anticipated the policy variables that we're interested in, in examining. And so I think we need to be a little bit worried that this case of X being in Z is not, is not necessarily the usual case. Um, for the variance, the plausible values give you some, ex, some help. Because there are two parts of the, of the distribution of the, if you think about the variation across an individual's plausible values, there are two components of that. One component of that is telling us about estimation error in these parameters mu z and sigma squared z. The, the second is random draws from the distribution around, around that post, the estimated posterior mean. Number one is important. If we need to know if, if to the extent that the, the data, the test sample isn't large enough to pin down mu of z and sigma squared z, we need to account for the, for the estimation error in that in doing our secondary analysis. And a way, one way to see that is to imagine the case where, where our x is aligned exactly with, with the z's that we're using in the model. If we just use the posterior means from the data set and ran a regression of that on z, we would get an r squared of 1. But that's not because the true r squared is 1. It's because that's, what, that's the only variation that's left. And so we would need the, the sampling error that we'd be worried about there is coming from that we're not sure about what mu z and sigma squared z are. And so we need to account for that in our analysis. And plausible values give us a way of doing that. The problem is that number two, the, the random draws from the distribution around that posterior mean, that's, not, that's just adding noise to our regression. And hopefully the test maker gives us enough plausible values that the noise goes away, but it's still just noise that, 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 is, that, that isn't really necessary and it's just, it's just a function of, of the draws that the test maker's computers decided to take. Okay, um, next one. What if we want to use theta as an independent variable? So now, if we had a noisy but unbiased estimate, that would bias this regression. Economists, again, are used to thinking of errors in variables, and with classical measurement error, we know that gamma would be attenuated, and delta would be biased as well, and the direction of the bias would depend on whether x was positively or negatively correlated with theta, but we know about that. If we knew how reliable theta was, we, we, we have kind of off-the-shelf corrections we could use to, to try to debias those coefficients. If we have plausible values, we can work, it can work, but only in certain circumstances. And Lynn is gonna talk a lot about this, so I won't spend too much time about it. Basically, we rely on there being, uh, the model that we wanna run is congenial with the model that was used to generate the data. And congenial, to my mind, I have a really hard time getting intuition for what models are and aren't congenial. But, but one way of thinking about it is, if the variables that they're conditioning on and generating the data set have both uh, the x's we're interested in and the y we're interested in them, in, in them which is in some ways the best case, then there is exactly one specification of, the, of, this, of this relationship that is congenial with the data. And maybe we get lucky and this linear relationship is the one that's congenial, but there's no necessary rule that says that's true. So we're, we really rely on getting lucky, basically, that the regression we want to run is, it lines up with, with the specification that was used in the data. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of good options to avoid this problem. Uh, one option is if we have the item response uh, data, the, the MISI model, model that Lynn is going to talk about is, is the way to go here, I think. Um, if the test makers, instead of giving us plausible values, could give us an unbiased estimate with known reliability, then I could apply my off-the-shelf errors and variables correction. Um, I, we'll talk about that in a minute. 
Uh, another thing that, that, I, that economists would be tempted to do is if we had noisy but, unbi noisy but unbiased estimates from two subscores where the noise was independent of each other, suppose we got a, t a score from the first half of the test and a score from the second half of the test, then we could run an instrumental variables regression with one score as an instrument for the other. And that would, that would de-bias it as well. Um, but let me, let me put that off for a minute. Okay. I'm wrapping up here. Let me just talk briefly about what, can, what we can do about it. I think the first thing we ought to think about is are there other statistics that we could distribute with tests that would help to avoid some of these problems? Uh, I do think there are things that, that could be provided. One is uh, it would be nice to have un noisy but unbiased estimates. Roughly, we can get an approximation to that by, by just maximizing the likelihood separately for each individual on the test. The problem with that is, the main problem, is if a student gets all the test items right or all the test items wrong, then the likelihood doesn't exist and we don't, and we don't have a, a proficiency estimate for that person if we, if we tried to maximize the likelihood individually. You could imagine doing, imputing some a score for one end or the other and that would, that would approximate what we're interested in here. Um, I would also like to see test makers distribute the posterior mean estimates directly rather than just the plausible value distribution and rely on me having to average the, them to get a noisy estimate of the posterior mean. Um, and, it would be, and I would also like the test makers to distribute the conditioning variables, Z. Often the conditioning variables come, up, come through a really complex system of taking 100, 100 principal components of 1,000 variables and, it's up to, and we just have to hope that, that we can reconstruct them by, by coding up the variables we have. I don't think it would, be, it would be impossible for test makers to just distribute which principal components they used. Um, another solution I think that would be worth exploring is releasing the item response, responses. It's putting more burden on the secondary researchers. Not all secondary researchers are going to be able to fit models for item responses. But if you want to get the answer right, that's really the only option. Um, and I think, again, part of the solution has to be that the secondary researchers have to be more, more sophisticated about how they use the data. Okay, um, I'm going to go not spend a lot of time talking about this. In the paper that I distributed, uh, we go through what we call a marginal maximum likelihood approach for estimating, for estimating the model. If you did have item responses data and you were interested in the dependent variable case, basically you can fit your own plausible values model with the right set of Xs or with the set of Xs you're interested in, not the set of Zs that the test maker chose, and you can, and you can get the regression you're interested in by, by doing that. In the independent variable case, you need the, another version of this uh, is the Misi model that Lynn will talk about. Similar idea. If you have the item responses, you can fit the model you're interested in. Uh, in and here it's now three equations, but it's the same basic idea uh, to, get the, to get the regression you're interested in. Okay, uh, so why don't I wrap up here and just say, as economists, we're used to, we, we have a bad reputation for being scavengers. We just go take whatever measures we can find and use them and don't worry about it. And I think that's sometimes deserved. Here's a case where we need to think more about where the data came from. And we can't just apply our off-the-shelf kind of classical measurement error way of thinking about the world, because that's not what plausible values are. We need to be a little more careful in how we interpret the results. On the other hand, even if we are sophisticated, there's not really more better ways to do it than the way that we often do it, given the data that's available. And so part of, part of improving practice here, I think, is providing measures that, that align better with the kinds of uses that people want to make want to use with the, make with the data, and that would require changes in the way in the way the tests are distributed. So I will stop there uh, and apologize for going over time. Thanks a lot. Uh, no, I think you stayed in you know, half an hour. Oh, Perfect. Uh, so our next speaker is Matthias uh, von der Vier, which, who is a distinguished resource scientist at the National Boards of Medical uh, Examiners, and uh, well, he will present the perspective of the other uh, research group. So, as a distinguished psychometrician, Matthias, the floor is, the floor is yours. <laughs> Ah, good. Okay, yeah, thank you for inviting me and good morning. Um, yeah, so this was a very interesting talk and I'm tempted really directly to relate to that, but I won't, <laughs> for several reasons. One of the reasons is that, um, yeah, I changed jobs and I learned about other types of tests. 
Um, and I would like just to start with an example because um, I think William did a very nice job introducing the whole session, telling us that we all need to learn more about the nature of tests, the types of tests that we are using, and the specific uses that are, well, first of all, intended, and then potential secondary uses that were not all fully intended at the time of making of the test. So for two years now, I've been with the uh, National Board of Medical Examiners, and there we test essentially everybody who is supposed to practice in the US uh, in the medical field as a doctor. And we test them for eight, nine hours a day. And we do this three times over the course of their studies. Um, would you do that if I don't give you anything for that test? So we ask them 350 multiple choice questions and then we test them with so and so many simulated patients and computer simulations and what have you. Um, so we can't do that unfortunately with people who get essentially nothing for the test in international or national assessments that are more or less surveys um, that people participate in voluntarily. So that's part of the difference that might also explain why um, for example, the National Assessment of Educational Progress doesn't release individual level data because they know it's extremely noisy. They know that students who participate may or may not pay attention, may or may not um, actually fill out the background questionnaire um, more or less consciously. Or <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to go in details there. So, but there's a lot of uh, issues with test scores that you get out of people who don't really get anything uh, for filling out this test. But uh, I'm going to talk today mainly about um, how those scores are generated, but I will be a little bit more general because, again, there are many different tests. And not all tests are used for all kinds of things uh, or are even usable for all kinds of purposes. Um, just imagine if you do just a quick test in, in, in the medical field for a certain disease and you get um, yeah, a positive result, but you might not have a test that is particularly um, yeah, expensive to make, you might also have a lot of uh, false positives there. So there are many issues around tests where you don't have a lot of items. Um, I only will go really quickly into the design of those tests, uh, which are also based on yeah, really broad coverage of a domain. Um, but let me start with a few slides. Um, I found this one and I really like that. It's a citation from um, Goldberger who wrote in Psychometrica about econometrics and psychometrics, a survey of commonalities. And he said, economists and psychologists have been developing their statistical techniques quite independently for many years. Uh, from time to time, a hardy soul strays across the frontier but is not met with cheers when he returns home. <laughs> and he goes on to say some nice, some not so nice things about the different fields, but I think it's really, really important that we talk more and we also, and this is why I really appreciate uh, Jesse's comments. And I think part of the data requirements are already met in the databases. It might take a while to actually get to those types of data and we will learn about alternatives and more sophisticated methods that don't rely on plausible values later today. So there are ways to get around the limitations of the data, but that doesn't mean the data are useless, and I try to more or less explain to you where they come from, what's specific about the way people are using or are generating those plausible value scores, um, and where else they're being used. And I hope I have enough time, because I have, again, just like Jesse, probably way too many slides. Um, so what is IIT and where does it come from and why do we use it? Um, why do we use IIT in this particular case? Why don't we just use some scores and just yeah, classical test theory with nice little well-behaved error terms around them? Um, then I'm going to talk about IIT in international surveys, in particular about this imputation model that's being used. And then who else is using models like that? And that is something that really surprised me because we should really talk more between psychometricians and economists. There are a lot of things that are very similar across those fields. 
So very similar models, and I will show you later, are used in both fields, sometimes up to the fact that sometimes we actually cite each other, but not very often. Um, yeah, so IRT has a pretty long history, so I can't even run the whole history here. I will just look at one particular perspective. That's, I'm just, uh, that's why I'm just listing a lot of authors here that are relevant to the field, and I'm again forgetting a lot of people who should also be listed here. Um, so there are hidden in there a few that you might recognize, um, but there are certainly a lot that you might not have seen if you're not concerned with psychometrics in particular. Um, a very old example, and I can't really see very well, um, is chest rating. Um, this goes back to, depending on where you look, either paired comparisons, Bradley and Terry models, or the ELO rating system, or it goes back way to Ernst Zermelo, who wrote in 1929 in the Journal of Mathematics, pretty, pretty much his only really applied paper on chess rating, uh, where he defined the probability of player A defeating player B is something like this. Uh, he devised a uh, way to do maximum likelihood estimation and shows the uniqueness and existence of the solution under a wide variety of incomplete designs for chess tournaments. And um, something similar then later on pops up as something that we might recognize then as early versions of IRT, so in this particular case, the Rush model. Here we have a sample of respondents and tasks, and yeah, you can also talk about maybe a test taker defeating a task or winning over a task or even solving it, and you essentially have the same structure here. You just have uh, a transformation Um, and essentially we have the ability to estimate uh, these parameters of item effects independently of the abilities, getting consistent estimates by uh, factorization and conditional maximum likelihood estimation, which also shows up later in the examples that I will show where else those models are being used. And um, Fisher later on then showed that the Rush model is a special case of the Samello model. This is why I showed you this one. And also shows that maximum likelihood estimates exist under unique, under mild conditions. Of course, uh, well noted, there is this problem with um, extreme scores. This might be a problem for short tests, but people have been working on that and also produced bias-reduced estimates that produce reasonable estimates also for extreme scores. Um, the nice part why these are also extremely important is uh, what's happening in international assessments or in national survey assessments. This thing, this uh, original version of maybe IRT or maybe something else, chess rating, was shown to work under pretty general, very incomplete conditions because not every chess player ag plays against every chess player. In NAPE and PISA and PIAC and all these assessments, you also have that all test takers don't test on all test items. They only take a very small subset of test items. So um, this again gives you then um, the advantage why we are using that and not just simple aggregates of test scores as in the old days, um, but rather a model that pre-processes the data. Um, then later on we have IRT, which is yeah, Lord and Novick, uh, Spook mainly is cited on that. Usually people forget that those chapters were actually written by Ellen Birnbaum. Um, again, N respondents, I tasks, and we have the 3PL, and Jesse already showed you that, so I'm not going to waste time on this one. Just being said that um, if we use the C parameter being zero, so we don't assume guessing, which is being done in PIAC, by the way, because we don't have multiple choice items. We all have 
uh, short open-ended items and computer-based items, so there's really no way to assume that you can easily guess the right response. We get the 2PL. Um, additionally, if all the slope parameters are the same, we obtain the rush model, so they are all related. One big happy family, more or less. Um, then for polytomous items, which are also important for some of the surveys, we have other types of models that um, again, reduced to the 2PL. Um, there's a nominal response model, there's a generalized partial credit model, and there's a three-volume handbook out by Wim van der Linden, which describes all these different models. So I'm not going to go into big detail here anymore. Um, one important assumption is local independence, just because we would like to have um, this ability estimate, whatever it might be, what domain, whether it's reading, math, science, depending on whatever items we're measuring. We would like this to be a probabilistic cause. We would like this to be the thing that really drives the responses on the uh, items. Um, in terms of estimation, we usually don't try to estimate these as fixed effects because these are incidental parameters. Um, Usually they are treated as random effects with the item difficulties fixed. And then one standard approach is max marginal maximum likelihood estimation with EM, stabilized Newton with Habermann's approach. Uh, I have to see why, whether I'm good in time more or less. Yeah, seems to be not too bad. So the estimation often is used as marginal maximum likelihood estimation, so we are assuming that we have a distribution of these scores and we maximize for the marginal likelihood and uh, for the 2PL this would be more or less looking like this, so that we have a sum over examinees. Then the likelihood function, here we have the distribution and we can have a normal distribution of some other um, uh, population density assumed. We can have multiple group cases, etc., and that is part of why this also is part of a much more general family of other models. Um, maybe one important nugget of knowledge, um, maximum likelihood has a problem with extreme, parameter, uh, with extreme response patterns, so Jesse mentioned the extreme um, people who don't have any items correct or solve everything, you can correct those maximum likelihood estimates with bias reduction. They are biased anyway when they're coming out just by maximizing the likelihood. But just by using either what Bayesians would call the Jeffreys prior or some penalty function that is uh, derived here by David Firth in Biometrica, as well as by Thomas Warm in Psychometrica again, uh, you can produce bias-corrected estimates that might actually fit the bill of uh, what Jesse was suggesting in the end. So <laughs> that is one of the things that could be easily done, that could certainly be added to data files. I think Sophia had a project, Sophia Rabe Hesketh, a couple of years ago with a student trying this kind of stuff. Um, I hope we have a lot of lunch breaks and coffee breaks also to discuss how big the effects will be in the end, but it's uh, one thing certainly to consider. Um, then for further reading, I included a couple of things that are PIAG related here, the technical report. Um, then here's an overview of item response theory research. Uh, it's a big chapter about what happened at ETS for about 50 or so years in terms of item response theory research and then for the rush model I also include in my handbook chapter there. Um, so there can be more details obviously because IRT is really a huge topic and, and can't be just uh, described in five, six slides. Um, So in terms of classical test theory, why don't we just use the test scores? Why do we go through all this very uh, obscure procedures to produce yeah, background variables, uh, do principal component analysis, do all this IRT stuff? Why don't we just use this naive little uh, classical test theory like in the olden times we have a total score plus an error score. Um, the problem is each test would have a different score range depending on the item scores and numbers and hence a different 
range for the true score, so we are also not getting rid of the problems of having not really defined what's the common variable there. Um, the other problem is that item response theory really, really tries to disentangle item and person effects and makes somewhat testable or really fully testable model assumptions. Of course, everything can be wrong, but there's then again this nice saying from uh, statistics that all models are wrong, but some might be useful, hopefully. Um, then there's a problem that actually also shows up in uh, international assessments as well as also in PIAC. We have different tests might be of different difficulty. We sometimes utilize that directly in terms of having adaptive testing. So where we try to adjust the test difficulty so that people are hopefully maximally challenged but also motivated to answer uh, such that they don't get test items that are way too difficult or way too easy. That's also one of the advantages of using models like IIT or more general latent variable models, um, that we can take different types of test forms and still come to something that in linked test forms uh, leads an expectation to the same estimate of theta. Um, so in summary, IIT has this direct advantages of allowing in incomplete designs, allowing adaptive testing, individualized item selection, and also allowing multidimensional latent variables, such as they are actually used in PIAC, PISA, etc. We don't just have achievement, we have different either literacy domains in PISA or, or in PIAC or different subject domains in other tests. Um, there are a lot of extensions to IRT, so you can include multi-level IRT, mixture IRT, diagnostic models, explanatory IRT models, and we will hear about other versions that directly use item response and can probably be seen as variants of IRT models with maybe structural assumptions later on today. Um, then another advantage is that we can use many different test forms. I think the latest iteration of PISA uses hundreds of different test forms. Um, PIAC used multi-stage testing, so was essentially exploiting those advantages in terms of adaptive testing. And we can check uh, invariants across populations, uh, assessment years, and more recently, assessment modes such as paper and computer-based assessments. Um, and then finally, and maybe most importantly, IRT is really just a special case of general latent variable or factor models. So there are early papers that pointed out that IRT can be viewed as a factor analysis for discretized variables or certain special cases are actually mathematical equivalent. A somewhat more recent paper, and again this list goes on and on and on, and if I mention, didn't mention somebody, I'm sorry, but uh, there are many papers that recently pointed out that uh, IRT is really just a framework within a framework, more or less, so you can view it as nonlinear mixed models, etc. So there's really nothing special about IRT in many ways. It really nicely integrates into models that are now um, well established as generalized latent variable models, and here Irini has a couple of papers on that who will later on also uh, discuss stuff uh, on those more extended versions. Um, just to look at this here, so you could just say, well, we can have a nonlinear mixed model. You can extend it by whatever gender, language groups, etc., effects, just by means of going from this little 2PL version here to something where we add effects and, and maybe add structure at different levels. Um, but now, finally, how is this used in international assessments? Um, the addition that happens here is IRT is being used as the measurement model. So how do we relate the responses we see to the underlying uh, achievement variables that we are interested in measuring? Um, and as Jesse already explained, this is extended by what people sometimes call population or conditioning models in order to integrate background information into the model. The goal is really to build an imputation model for theta, and that also nicely came out in the previous talk. Plausible values is really, yeah, I understand it more or less historically that they call it plausible values, but it's in some ways a misnomer. It's an imputation model. And imputation models can be useful, 
most of them are at some level if you produce all kinds of models that you would like to use with imputation models. Most models will have limitations. What they try here in those international assessments is to throw in essentially everything we have in terms of additional background information. And yeah, I don't want to come across as uh, calling it a cheap joke or something, but uh, Ruben calls it the kitchen sink approach. <laughs> You throw everything into the kitchen sink and hope more or less the, the right mixture comes out and you have all the variables in there that more or less give you yeah, control for everything there is. Uh, but of course, you might be interested in this additional variable or you might be interested only in a particular set of variables and then uh, you might want to use something else. But And another point to be made is somebody said that those plausible values are very good for most things, but they are not perfect for any particular thing. So there's one thing to be said about that you will get a set of variables that are good to be used for many standard analysis and also uh, in particular given the goals that have been uh, in de uh, originally being devised is to use them for those types of group comparisons that we saw earlier. So you might have different school types, you might have gender groups, ethnicity groups, um, and you're interested essentially in comparing those groups with pre-specified analyses because that is the type of policy analysis that are pre-planned when you design the study. Um, the secondary uses will be much more diverse and there you might want to see whether you can use those plausible values or you might want to use the response level data and um, essentially develop your own model which will be much more involved to do. And uh, you might get a somewhat different answer. Some, sometimes it might not be worth the effort, sometimes it might be very well worth the effort and um, that really depends on whether you can see whether the variables that are represented in this imputation model are more or less well covering what you intend to do. There are a couple of papers in um, a volume, they are they're actually scattered across different um, uh, journals and, and, and volumes. So there's one paper in the handbook of uh, international large-scale assessments that we edited a couple of years back where people from the NAEP group did a study on those kinds of biases that you get if you have more or less complete imputation models and there the results were pretty encouraging for the operational set of variables. But again, there are counterexamples. So I think again, we need a lot of coffee breaks, we need a lot of discussions around how we can improve things, but uh, you will also see in the literature very encouraging examples of how complete this list of variables is. But let's go on. More likelihood functions, and I hope I didn't exhaust you completely with all these equations. I already heard something talk, <laughs> something about, well, some talk about glazing over. Uh, it's getting, there's a saying that every equation more or less cuts the number of readers in half in a paper, but <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, so here's another likelihood function. It's essentially the same as before. Uh, sometimes this ability distribution is assumed to be normal. It can be something else, can be more general. And then, oh, it's really nice that we actually use the same variable uh, letter here. That's by complete, we didn't exchange anything before the talk, so, but the Z is completely incidental. <laughs> so we essentially just have a conditional ability distribution here. And yeah, for simplicity, I just assume a uh, unidimensional ability variable, which is probably, except for NAEP, never true, so neither in PIAC nor in, in PISA. Um, and then we have essentially a distribution for the ability distribution of this individual theta that depends on a conditional mean and a, a common error variance. And very often this is just done by means of a simple uh, linear regression of the background variables. They are pre-processed for a variety of reasons. We can go into detail maybe later on after the discussion, etc. Um, 
The bases, however, are raw responses based on questionnaire items and maybe additional information about the school at other levels of, of data collection. Um, they contain demographics, they might contain something like interactions, so uh, immigration status by gender, because that is actually uh, a thing that is important. So uh, immigrants from different countries differ a lot in terms of how, how well they do in the school systems. And uh, in tendency, girls tend to do better in schools uh, with immigration status, probably in general by now. Um, there's also parental education by ethnicity or language at home because education is actually has a very differential effect. Also years of schooling is not worth the same across ethnic groups. So there are a lot of things where you will see that there are a lot of interaction effects that, that actually would tell, tell you that you can't use a variable just yeah, as it is and assume it has nice properties. So one year worth of schooling is worth that much in terms of outcomes. It might actually depend on your ethnicity, et cetera. Uh, then there's a lot of self-report um, about activities at home, homework, academic enjoyment of different topics, college aspiration, et cetera. And don't let me get started on whether those are interval scaled, but <laughs> five minutes. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's but that's part that's part of the problem. If you don't have them, you would uh, end up with a bias, because you want to shrink your estimates, your group-based estimates, towards essentially those variables. It's um, more recently. Whoops. Sorry. We also think about how to do background models which might include process data, but that's not yet something to be uh, discussed in, it's more a question for research. So right now in terms of operational uh, procedures, only those kinds of variables go in there. A little bit about non-response and potentially about process data, but later more about that, I would guess. So and then finally, given all those parameters, and uh, using fixed item parameters for a variety of reasons that I don't have the time to talk about now, one of them being linking to the past, but let's just leave it at that. Uh, we essentially fit this latent regression model by country and um, finally use this to generate imputations, which people tend to call plausible values in, in this context. But it's really just an imputation model with all that comes with it. It's a model for what's going on in terms of achievement data given all the responses and all the background variables. Uh, and that's more or less what we are talking about today. So this is that one use case, maybe as one specific thing. And you might think about it in terms of what that means. Um, sometimes the design and the requirements drive you to produce plausible values or imputations for people who didn't take some of the subscales. So you might have people who take a reading scale and a math scale, but not science. But people like complete data. So then based on the background data, only on the Z here, there will be imputations for science, even though somebody never took a science item. So there, there are limitations of the database, but that's driven by people wanting more and more testing domains. So NAEP is much more conservative there and tests usually just a focused booklet with one domain. So there, there are things that we really need to talk longer term about uh, what we are building up because um, those types of design features certainly make things much more model dependent. Uh, but now something, because I tried to prepare for this talk and I was really happy because I found this initial uh, citation by um, this economist in Psychometrica. So who else is using these models? There's, for example, the Ising model that maybe some of you might know, some most might not, I don't know. It's originally from statistical mechanics, then somehow popped up in uh, Paul Holland's work on the Dutch identity based on a dissertation by Zhao. Cox and Vermut in the statistical literature. It's called the quadratic exponential model. 
that thing is actually pretty similar to IRT models and with certain special cases you directly see it. And that thing, for example, shows up in explaining bubbles and crashes, which I found kind of interesting, market bubbles and crashes. Sometimes somebody uh, tried to invade economics from physics, which was also interesting. So spin models were tried to, to, to essentially explain what's happening uh, in those bubbles and crashes. Multinomial choice models are essentially identical to what I would call a polytomous IRT model. So this is McFadden and Hausmann. This is McFadden, here's his talk for the Nobel Prize. Uh, then econometrics or economics and psychometrics using principal component analysis or nowadays independent component analysis. Um, Factor models, I hope we hear a lot about this later on. Actually, the citation I gave you first, uh, that guy came from economics, but also was publishing with uh, Karl Juriskirk at some point, writing about structural equation models. Um, and just to think about again, factor models are essentially IRT or IRT are factor models for discretized variables. So. As long as we talk about the limitations of one, we also talk about the limitations of the other, unfortunately. Um, there's a lot of factor models. This guy here was the head of the Fed, I guess, uh, has been working on factor models. This paper is, has been cited 2,000 times. Uh, the paired comparison even shows up, I think, more in the land economics. Uh, and this is my favorite here because there I felt really at home. <laughs> so panel models for binary data are essentially uh, rush models in many ways, so some of them at least, or uh, rush models are part of the panel models for binary data, I should rather say. Uh, there's a nice book actually, it's a little bit older, I think this is by now online. There's a paper that came out by Chamberlain only in 2010 in Econometrica. I think his original chapter goes back to the 80s. And he's citing um, Erling Andersen and Georg Rasch about the conditional maximum likelihood estimation there. Um, so there are a lot of very interesting cross-links, so we should really talk more. <laughs> That's more or less my <laughs> the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. <laughs> and now we have uh, uh, two discussants that are invited to, to, to join me. So uh, we have Henry Ho, who is a professor uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, so, Andrew, you can start. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Ho. Again, I'm uh, on the faculty at Harvard's Graduate School of Education, where I teach uh, statistics uh, and measurement. I'm actually proud to say I've got a couple of, of students uh, in, in the room today, former students in the room today. Um, so. Uh, I hope I hope they find this um, familiar. Maybe um, maybe not. <laughs> um, so the title of my talk today uh, is "Plausible Values, Plausible Transformations." Um, a subheading might be, um, uh, or uh, some of my best friends are are economists. Um, so so this line is usually used uh, in the states um, just before or just after. Uh, you make a bunch of reductive, maybe insulting caricatures of the people you're, uh, you've just mentioned. Uh, so I will try not to do that today for, for economists. Um, I, I, it's actually true. I, I, some of my best friends are economists. I, I sit in a hallway with uh, a bunch of great folks. Um, uh, Dave Deming is, is around the, the corner, also at the Kennedy School, and uh, Eric Taylor, um, Tom Kane, Felipe Barrera, all great economists of education who I find uh, quite thoughtful and quite excellent. And so um, not too many caricatures and insults um, from me today um, as, a, as a psychometrician. Uh, and so this is going to be my discussion. I, I think I have 15 minutes. Is that about right? Okay, so I, I will try to stick with that, with that time. Great. Um, all right, so, uh, so these um, talks you just heard uh, are from papers that I want to 
point out to you and, and recommend to you. So this is the job of a discussant is, to, is basically to sell the papers and they are both good papers and they are both in conversation with each other which I think is excellent and to the points um, that, that Jesse and Matthias just made. Um, th these are two, you know, four folks from different disciplines uh, engaging with each other and bringing their perspectives to bear. Um, and I wish we had mo more of this and I'm, I'm really grateful again to PIAC and OECD for bringing us here today to continue um, that conversation. So uh, uh, Brian and Jacob's piece is in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, um, and Henry and Matthias's piece is in the appropriately named uh, Large Scale Assessment in Education. Um, and so uh, I, I strongly recommend you check out these papers. It's good, it's good to have a, a, a kind of a little bit of a debate, is frankly what this is. And so I'll tell you where I land, uh, and at the end of the day, maybe we can all put it to a, a vote. What do you think? All right, so, uh, so let's see. Um, uh, first, I want to frame this, and again, I think both um, uh, Jesse um, and, and Matthias have mentioned this in their papers, and it's sort of in the, in the first paragraph of the invitation to this conference itself. Why are we talking about this? And why are we talking about this now, uh, in this, this particular time, right? Um, so first, LSAS, always good to have a new acronym. Uh, so uh, so uh, large-scale assessment surveys, right? So F, what, what does LSAS mean? First of all, it's large-scale, LS, right? Um, and it's not just large-scale. I mean, there's more test scores in California than, than, than there are in these, these, um, these uh, surveys. Um, but, but what do we mean by a large scale, right? In particular, large scale assessment surveys target population level inferences and comparisons. Um, comparisons are important, right? They're across subgroups, states, and countries. Those are compelling. Those are important. Those are not enabled by um, any other assessments that are done by particular researchers or particular jurisdictions. Number two, uh, LSAS. LS could also stand for low stakes, right? And that's hugely important, why? Because when, when test scores have high stakes, as my colleague Dan Koritz would emphasize over and over again, it's, they're, harder, they're harder and harder to trust, right? These tests, are, our assessments, are generally held in very high esteem by researchers and the public because they're not high stakes, right? So they're less likely to be targets for political opposition uh, or, as Dan Koritz would say, inflation, right? So we can, arguably, we can trust these sc scores more. More people can trust these scores, so that's important too, right? Um, third, LSAS, the A in there, is for assessments. Uh, they are not evaluations, they are not designed to be, right? So they're designed for measurement. And I think part of what you're hearing in this tension here is a psychometrician saying, we designed this for this purpose. And Jesse, of speaking for economists, is saying, but they're really useful for this other purpose. We should enable people to use them for that purpose. And we're like, hey, hold on. That's not how they were designed. And so this is the conversation we're having, right? This, they're for one purpose, they're for another purpose. And if we have conflicting purposes, um, we're going to have um, um, conflicting methods, right? Um, so as I say here, they are, or they would be, if we did some other things uh, that we're going to talk about today, uh, natural tools for policy evaluations using current statistical and, and, and econometric techniques. Uh, and then fourth, I would say this, like, the, the, why are we talking about it today? LSAS, I was looking for a good adjective here, and the adjective I ended up going with is oracular, like, like an oracle, right? The oracle says, and you have no idea why or how, right? You just, you just take this, and you're like, all right, I don't, I don't really know uh, how that works. And I think it's quite true that very few under, few under we might have the highest, like in all the rooms in the world right now, we might have the greatest proportion of folks who actually understand how this works in this room, right? Very, but very few understand how they work or what to do with available secondary data, and that's why Jesse and Brian's paper is so important, is it's taking what's pretty commonly known in sort of high-level psychometric fields and bringing them to other fields. And I'm very, very grateful for them for writing that and bringing that to another field. So I think these are the four reasons why this is important to talk about and important to talk about now. Okay, so there are three essential questions that I see in the sort of debate, if you will, between um, Jesse and Matthias, and I'm going to tell you where I land, and then we'll see if we come to consensus, okay? Uh, so the first question are, are currently released plausible values useful for answering causal questions? And so what I did here is I created a scale, and on one end of the scale I've got Jesse, and on the other end of the scale I've got Matthias, and this is an equal interval scale. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, so I'm going to tell you where I stand here, right? Because Jesse, does Jesse represent yes or no here? Right. Jesse is saying no, <laughs> they're not. And Matisse is saying, if you read, if you read his paper and Henry's paper, they're saying. Ah, Good enough, maybe, and uh, this might be a caricature of my own colleague in psychometrics here. But I think he's, saying, he's more than Jesse. What I think he's saying, ah, pretty good, pretty good, right? So. <laughs> We're not getting into content, Matthias. No 
<laughs> maybe, maybe this is a multi-dimensional scale, right? <laughs> um, so I, I would say I'm actually more here in, in this case, right? I agree a little bit more with Jesse here. Um, and uh, we'll get to, once we get to my third question, I think at the end of the day, we might actually come to some kind of consensus about what we might do about this. And that's a significant contribution of this, of today's seminar, if we can come to consensus about the answer being, eh, maybe not so much here, and what we should do about that. Okay. Um, so we can't always tell is my answer to this question, right? So the, so the answer is, is in, in my opinion, no, that's me speaking here, no, right? Um, number two, and this is uh, what, what we're going to talk a little bit more about today later too, um, test score scales are not equal interval. Is this a problem, right? And here, again, uh, Jesse, I think, would say yes, and Matthias, I think, would say, ah, not, not much of a problem. And here, I actually agree a little bit more with Matthias, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why. Um, so, uh, no, so I would say, you know, the, to preview my answer here, test score scales are no more uh, equal interval than many other, or no less uh, uh, equal interval than any other scale. So my answer here is, is meh, right? Um, and so, so no, that's not as much of a problem, I think. Um, so then third, this is, I think, going to be the, the, the big question about today. What should we do about this? And I'm going to say, for one, allow select researchers access to item level data. Right, that's my putting my researcher hat on. That's my recommendation. I think it's up to PIAC and, and NAGB and NCES. And uh, I sit on the National Assessment Governing Board that oversees NAEP, and so th these problems are, are important, right? So that becomes then a policy question about how to do this. But, the, but if you ask me whether or not we should do this, I, th I think the answer is yes, I think we should. Now, if we could come to consensus around that today, everybody here should put it to a vote, um, that would be significant. Uh, for number two, um, assess plausible transformations uh, as a specification check. Jesse mentioned this. We'll talk more about this in, in a later session today. Um, so those are my three, uh, my three um, questions, just to go back again. Are currently released plausible values useful for answering causal questions? I'd say, oh, we can't always tell. So, so the answer then is no, if we can't always tell. Um, test score scales are not equal intervals is a problem. I think uh, not really so much. Um, and what should we do about this? Um, access, allow access to item level data for select researchers and assess plausible transformations. So, uh, well, uh, to, so I'm going to go through these one at a time, right? So, so first, it's uh, it's pretty well known in the sense that it exists on a web page um, <laughs> that that these issues are, are a problem. So this is again, I sit in the National, National Assessment Governing Board. So NAEP um, and NCES have this statement here: potential bias in analysis results using variables not included in the model, right? So this is a lot about what Jesse and Matthias were talking about. You can read all the fine print there. The source is at the bottom. Uh, but these issues uh, are are known, right? That when you start to chuck in variables, policy variables of the kind that Jesse and many economists are interested in, um, you, you end up with um, biases, some if uh, some where we, we sort of can anticipate the direction, but we don't know the degree. Um, so that, that becomes, it becomes a real issue. Um, so I want to have a little bit of a conversation with um, sock puppet Henry and Matthias over here, um, and uh, with my comments. And this is I'm taking excerpts from 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 their paper, right? So this is uh, this is Henry and Matthias, uh, my esteemed colleagues, um, uh, who I respect very much. Let me just say, so these are just slight differences of opinion, right? Note that the secondary analysis model is typically a subset of the latent regression model used to generate the possible values. This is Henry and Matthias here. So here and here's me, right? Um, I'm not sure we can assume this for some folks, especially policy analysts, right? When we designed, when we, the grand we, the sort of psychometricians up on the hill, the oracle, right? When we designed plausible values, we said, well, we want to give folks the ability to sort of replicate our results and replicate and extend our results, but only in particular, in limited ways. Um, and of course, these enterprising economists come along and say, but I have questions that only your data can answer, and you're just giving me this very limited model of the world, right? And so, um, so I think that's sort of at the heart of this issue. Um, so here, Matthias and uh, Henry continue. However, if variables beyond those in the latent regression are used in a secondary analysis, then bias estimates may result. And this is what we've been talking about, right? Yes, this is well known. Jesse mentioned this. It's on the web page. This is a, an issue. Uh, on the other hand, since the PV's generating model typically includes as many factors are available, and this is where Matthias was mentioning the kitchen sink. We chuck it all in there, right? Um, even these additional variables outside with what we, what we anticipated may be effectively included by proxy to the extent that they are correlated with the variables incorporated in the latent regression. So what they're saying is, ah, it's because we have so many, because we have these thousands of variables and these hundreds of principal components, eh, probably good enough. And, and I'm, I guess I'd say, like, to what extent is this and how do we know that that's enough is, I think, is I think what a lot of good research that, that Matthias and others have, have done is essentially about. But how do we know? Um, it's very akin, I I think to 
multiple regression with the kitchen sink or, um, uh, or matching methods with the kitchen sink, where we sort of hope that we're covering everything, but we don't, we don't then say, yes, we have a causal estimate because we controlled for a whole bunch of variables. We know not to say that, right? And so I think this is an analog here where I'm not sure we can say that, that it's, it's covered, right, by the existing, even if we have a ton of variables, I'm not sure we can say that it's covered. Right. Um, so again, here's Henry and sock puppet Henry and sock puppet Matthias here. Um, uh, they're talking about um, Jacob and Rothstein here. Also offer examples of situations where certain school level characteristics are of interest but were not included in the conditioning model. Yes, this is the concern. Uh, and in actual practice, this may not be a problem. Again, this is their thesis, right? Um, su such characteristics are either drawn directly from items incorporated in the school questionnaire and are part of the conditioning or indirectly through inclusion of a dummy coded school identifier. And, and again, this may not be a problem. That, that sort of, uh, we, uh, it may not be a problem, is what I'm going to press on, right? And I, I think this is the challenge, right? Uh, to what degree and how do we know? And that we don't know is, I think, Jesse and Brian's point. And I, I think it's a good point. Right? So if particular characteristics that become subsequently available are of interest, then this is, this is sock puppets again, um, then supplementary latent regression models can be run to generate new PVs so as to ensure unbiased estimation. And so here, Matthias is potentially agreeing, saying, yeah, yeah, why not allow select folks to do that? Why don't we let them do that? Right? And maybe we might all come to agreement on that, um, that, that that's, that's what might be done. And so that, that's, this is here, here where I agree a little bit more um, with um, caricature Jesse versus caricature Matthias. Okay, so uh, that's the first question. Um, the, the second is a uh, test score scales are not equal interval. Is this a problem? Um, and here, um, Jesse was saying, yeah, that's a problem. And uh, I might say, I might sort of more to agree with more sock puppet Henry and uh, Matthias that I'm not so sure it is a problem. And this really is at the sort of heart of measurement. Um, so it's, it's worth really grappling with this. And we're gonna, I'm, here I'm afraid we're, we should sort of reorder the presentations because I'm going to start discussing another paper that, that, that hasn't been brought up yet. Um, so, uh, so, so wait, uh, IRT, I would say, actually does kind of provide an equal interval scale. We should talk about what that is. In what sense is theta equal interval? Right? Um, if the model fits the data, which is something we can assess, right, um, then uh, there is an equal interval scale underlying theta. It's not a very satisfying one, but many equal interval scales aren't so satisfying, right? So this is my, um, this is, this is, this is my little animation from Fred Lord's um, uh, 1980 um, review of IRT. Um, so if we have some sort of latent response process, right, this latent scale on the y-axis, um, and the theta scale on the x-axis, right, every item and a group of people's response to it can be determined by a threshold, which I think, I'm colorblind, so I think that's red. Um, that, that, so that's how, if, if it goes up, that's a more difficult item. If it goes down, that's a less difficult item. And then it also can be determined by a slope, right? That's that discrimination parameter there. And a steeper item is more discriminating and a, and a shallower item is less discriminating. And what I'm gonna show you is that what, what the, the whole idea behind the item characteristic curve, right, is that as you move up in theta, you follow along this classic C normal CDF, right? This 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 classic sort of ogive, right? And what I'm doing, what what that what's, what you see over there on the right is the area. Where's my laser pointer here? Danger, danger. Oh, that's that's the one, right? So um, so that little area under the curve there is what I'm plotting on the y-axis over here. Um, the probability of getting an item correct. So what I'm going to do here is just step up here, and as you can see that area under the curve is growing and growing and growing. It starts to get even steeper as, you, as, as the mode crosses. And then as you go up, it's, it's just following a, a, a classic normal CDF, okay? So what you, what you might have missed there, right, is that this is an equal interval scale. How, right? So there's three steps to thinking about this logic, right? The first is that the theta scale is linear in the probits, right, in, in, in terms of uh, in terms of, oh, which one is this? Um, in, in terms of the uh, normal units, right, that are underlying this, right? That's the first step in seeing that. The second, the theta scale renders normal the underlying response processes of the respondents. The fact that this is actually normally distributed is, uh, is what, that scale, what this theta scale gives us. Right? And then third, a, a logit, a log of the odds, which is what underlying all the IRT models that they showed, approximates a probit. Right? And so this, is, this motivates the, that crazy model that we saw, 
right, that there is some normal response process underlying all of this. And theta, if the model fits, provides the scale in which it's linear in the probits or linear in the logits and, the, and renders the response process distribution either logistic or normal, which are very, very close distributions. Right, so there is an admittedly arcane argument for an equal interval scale underlying um, these, uh, these um, uh, distributions. I mean, th these, this scale. IRT is essentially a scaling model. So in sum, IRT's theta is a scale that's linear in the log of the odds of correct responses to the items. There is an equal interval interpretation. It's not a very good one. You couldn't tell it to somebody on the street. But how often do you make the argument for temperature being an equal interval scale on, to someone on the street, right? Um, it's, not, it's not something we need to bring up. As long as there's a basis, an empirical basis for it, that's a start, right? So, uh, in other, and I actually I prefer writing IRT models as in, in terms of the logits itself, and then you can just see that it's a simple linear model. If I want to impress people, I show them the version that Jesse and Matthias um, showed, which is a little more, more intimidating looking. I would argue this is a little bit less intimidating, although maybe it's equally intimidating, I don't know. We should scale it. Uh, but so uh, this is simply a linear and the log odds expression. So this does not imply, now don't get me wrong here, I'm not saying this is equal interval on in all occasions, right? This does not imply that the resulting scale has universal equal interval properties. And I think that, that um, Tim and Kevin have done a really good job of talking about that, that in their paper, which is to come. Um, but it's not like we have a universally equal interval scale, but nor do we have a universally equal interval scale when it comes to temperature or even dollars, right? To what, to what extent do, is, is fi does five dollars still mean five dollars and I'm a millionaire versus I'm poor, right? Um, and so to what extent does five degrees mean the same interval when it's really hot versus it's really cold, right? These are questions that, that, uh, that are hard to answer, but they start with a basis for equal interval measurement, and then you can quibble with, right? You can apply transformations to people's varying value functions. So the consensus view in educational measurement then is that the scale is uh, from a well-fit IRT model is convenient but not cardinal. Right? It's, real, it's a useful basis for st starting a conversation, but it isn't, at the end of the day, going to be uh, equal interval for all purposes. And that's where uh, research like, like Tim and Kevin's and others is really interesting. Um, so monotone transformations of the theta scale, as, as Jesse mentioned, do fit the data equally well. But again, the starting point wasn't without a basis. Right? It has a basis. Um, it, but it is true that we should explore other transformations. Um, it's true of many equal interval scales. And, and Henry and Matthias, in their paper, make the argument for temperature and, um, and, and dollars and, and all sorts of other scales in which our interpretations of distances may be different at different intervals. Um, so the limited equal interval properties of IRT theta make it a good starting point from which to evaluate sensitivity to transformations, and people may quibble with the degree of flexibility in the transformations that we apply. Um, Sean and I have done some work in this, and you, you'll see Tim and Kevin's work uh, applies typically more extreme transformations. Okay, that's a lot. Um, so, uh, so, I, um, uh, so, so what are we going to do about this, right? We, we, I think, can anticipate um, I know we can anticipate which analyses are going to be more susceptible to, to transformation invariance right, than others. Right? So um, this is some work I published a long time ago, um, in my, even in my dissertation. So any A-B comparisons, whether treatment or control or focal reference gaps, are generally not scale sensitive. Right? It's not that often, right? usually if you're comparing very, very low achieving and very, very high achieving, at least traditionally high achieving groups, those distributions have not too much overlap in the PDFs and almost no overlap in the CDFs. Right? They only cross maybe arbitrarily at some extreme point. They are what we call stochastically ordered. They are hard to reverse under any scale transformation. However, um, AB, uh, AB, difference, AB differences, right? differences in gaps, right? gap trends, which is what Tim and Kevin and others have looked at, um, whether they're interactions, gap trends, or here's a big one for the economist, right? differences in differences. Whenever you have these differences in differences, those inferences will be transformation dependent. Right? And, and, and I'm saying here are often another way to describe it as scale sensitive. Right? So that we can actually take various methods and interpretations and rank them by in, like, in a kind of order in which they're likely to be right, susceptible to transformation invariance. But even before we start to 
test out plausible transformations. So here's just a little bit of an illustration of how we can do this, right? So these are CDFs from a low scoring group making progress, a little bit of progress. So assume this is some low scoring group. This is a normal, uh, this is some uh, distributed CDF. They've made a little bit of progress and then the high scoring group has made a little bit of progress. And this is usually what we see, right? A classic test score gap trend. Right. Time one, time two, they make a little bit of progress. In NAEP, sometimes they go back a bit. Right? <laughs> so, um, so this is a classic example. And what we can do to test right, the, the ordering of the gaps is to say, okay, um, here in time one, this group is a very low scoring group. In time two, is, is, we have a very high, in time one, we have a high scoring group. Those CDFs don't cross. There's almost nothing you can do to change the order of these groups. It'd have to be some crazy transformation. Right. So, but the gaps, right, if we take the vertical difference between these CDFs for the gaps at time one and the gaps at time two, we get a, two, two curves that look like this. And that these curves cross shows us that these gaps can't be ordered consistently across transformations. Right? And in fact, the, as, as we emphasize positive areas of the score distribution here, um, this gap starts to dominate. And if we or, uh, emphasize negative uh, areas of the score distribution here, that gap starts to dominate. Right? And so this is where you get, this is where you can anticipate, right? So for, well, I, I actually called this sort of first order stochastic ordering where you have a high scoring and low scoring group crossing or not. And I call this second order stochastic ordering where you have the gaps um, uh, crossing or not. And unfortunately the term second order stochastic ordering, this is what I didn't know as a graduate student, was already claimed um, in terms of differences between means versus differences in variance. So I, uh, that's, I, I have to think of a new term for, for, but this is the idea is that if the vertical differences between the CDFs cross in any kind of differences and differences analysis, you're gonna have and clearly anticipatable uh, transformation dependence of the ordering of gaps, right? So this is the kind of work I think that will help us like anticipate whether or not um, anyone's analysis or research um, is gonna be, have their conclusions flipped by, um, by transformations. So to sum up um, the, of the three essential questions, right? Um, are currently released plausible values um, useful for answering causal questions? We should put it to a vote at the end of the day. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm leaning towards no, and so I think there's some policy questions that PIAC and other testing programs have to address to say, okay, how can we give select researchers access so they can do the kind of causal work that these testing programs, I think, should enable? Right. Number two, test score scales are not equal intervals. Is this a problem? Uh, I think less of a problem than I even used to think um, uh, back when I was um, in, in the heart of this research, maybe 10 years ago or, or, or so. Um, I, I'm not so sure. I think it's, I think it's interesting, um, and there are some really clever solutions um, that, are, that are coming up to scale um, tests to a particular reference, but the reference can always change. I think the key is to be clear about what that reference is. Right? Um, and then third, what should we do about this? For one, allow select researchers access to item level data. We should put it to a vote. Um, and then for two, um, assess plausible transformations using clever methods that, um, that we will discuss later today. Um, so with that, um, I look forward to the conversation for the rest of the day. Thanks very much.